I'm Spencer Muzik, and joining me now is lawyer turned Disney expert Lou Mangello. He is an internationally recognized Walt Disney World historian who has written trivia books about the resort. Also, Lou is the host and producer of WDW Radio, an award winning online show dedicated to celebrating the magic of Walt Disney World. Welcome, Lou. Thank you for joining us today. Spencer, thanks so much for having me. Really appreciate it. So, Lou, before we get to all things Disney, I want to talk about your professional career after you graduated from law school. So, what kind of law did you practice and for how many years? So, uh, I graduated Seton Hall Law School, uh, and actually I clerked for the presiding judge up in Essex County, New Jersey for a year before moving into private practice with my father. Uh, and I practiced for about 10 years before I left. And when did you form Imagine Enterprises, which was a computer consulting and web development firm? So I always had sort of the entrepreneurial spirit at heart. Uh, I had formed it a number of years earlier. Always, um, I grew up very fortunate, always having computers around, and I sort of started turning my hobby into a business, um, especially very early on when small business networking and web development was really starting to take hold. So you did this before you went to law school, is that right? Uh, I sort of did it alongside. I had done it earlier. Um, even in college, I was doing a little bit of uh, computer work. And then while I was actually in the practice of law, I really built my computer consulting business as well. Well, in forming the company, though, did you sort of see it as an exit strategy for from the practice of law at the time? Never. Um, okay. I, you know, I had always grown up. Uh, my father was an attorney. I, I watched Injustice for All way too many times. So I, I knew <laughs> I wanted to be a lawyer, but I always had this sort of knack for um, for computers uh, because I didn't really date very much in high school. So uh, as I saw small businesses with that need, I wanted to sort of be their go-to person. And I found myself spent really juggling two full-time careers. I could be in federal court in the morning and then be going and pulling cable for a networking client in the afternoon, back to the office to meet with clients, and then in the evening doing web development till two o'clock in the morning. So I was sort of juggling or balancing the, the two careers at the same time for Which a while. Which is pretty incredible. So, I mean, would you say that you loved practicing law, but that you there was always a part of you that knew you would explore other interests? Yeah, um, I, I think it's, again, growing up sort of with that entrepreneurial sp spirit that my parents had sort of instilled in me. Uh, I love the law. I, I still believe it's a very noble profession. I love the idea of helping people. And I think that's sort of what we brought into the uh, IT consulting as well, too. But I never really expected that the journey would eventually take me out of the practice of law. But as I found that the IT stuff was, uh, it never felt like work to me. Um, that's sort of where the path I started to head down. Yeah, because you love technology so much so that you became the chief technology officer and director of operations for a medical imaging company. How long did you hold that position? Uh, I had that for a number of years. Um, really enjoyed that as well, too. Uh, it, it sort of took me out of the day-to-day -day running around uh, supporting individual clients in, in terms of working and helping to grow uh, a company. I did that for a number of years until the company was sold in 2007. So when did you begin to do more than just imagine a career field with all things Disney? When did you start taking steps headed in that direction? I, I never imagined a career or a future having anything to do with Disney. Um, I, uh, about 2003, I think always because I was always in a service industry, whether it was IT or the practice of law, I, I probably watched one too many infomercials late at night. And I had this idea. I wanted to, to make something once, right? I wanted to make something once and resell it. And the idea of a book is what uh, sort of hit my mind. Uh, I wasn't smart enough to write about the law. I couldn't write about computers. And the only thing I really knew a lot about and had all this useless knowledge rolling around my head in was Disney World. Well, uh, how did you have this knowledge, though? Is it because you went to, didn't you go to the College of Disney Knowledge uh, at some I, point? I really, it really goes back to being a child. Um, I, we went down to Disney. We, we lived in New Jersey, but we drove to Florida every year. We visited Disney World at least once a year. So I was there three months after the park opened um, in 1971. We went back year after year, and I became fascinated with the place. What was it that was drawing us back to Disney World, us and 30 million other people every single year? And the more I learned, as I started to sort of peel back the layers of the onion, the more I became fascinated with the operations and the logistics and just how they were able to move and really make this city run 24-7. I read and talked to everybody that I possibly could uh, growing up. So you launched your first Disney website in 2003. You began podcasting in 2005. What were some of those early podcasts about? 
<laughs> um, you know, they're still out there. Not that I recommend going back to listen to them uh, because I never intended to do it, Spencer. The, the end game for me was to write a book and can I get it published? Can I be validated by having a book published? I learned everything I could, have, could about book publishing. I found a publisher and I signed a multi-book deal. And when my little two-page brochure website started becoming more like articles, which are what we called blog posts back then, and then a community. I started sort of an online discussion forum. And when there were 29 people that signed up, I said, this is so cool. There's 29 other dorks sitting in their basement <laughs> thinking about Disney World as much as I am. Well, 29 turned into 30,000 pretty quickly. And I said, you know, there's something to this. Uh, there is a community of people who are hungry for content. And when I saw podcasting coming down the pike in 2005, I realized very early on that the spoken word is so much more powerful of a medium than anything I could write in books or on the website. And the problem being in 2005, uh, who was going to find it and who was going to take the time to listen to me drone on about Disney? But a lot of people were. And, and I say that because, again, Disney enthusiasts are very hungry to sort of be connected to that Disney experience. And I want to share it in this way that allowed me to just sort of talk about something that I liked. I wanted people to feel as though they were sitting around the virtual table with me, to use a Jerseyism, sitting around the diner with me <laughs> uh, on Route 9 somewhere, talking about something we all enjoyed and made us happy. Um, so I talk about everything from vacation planning to interviews to history to trivia to news that was going on that week, uh, really trying to cover all things Disney World. Well, and so by 2008, was it in 2008 when you actually decided to move to Florida with your family? Yeah, so that was sort of the big leap of faith as this hobby started to turn into something that I found out that I could um, actually start turning into a business. It was very accidental, never part of the grand plan to podcast about Disney World for a living. But I found myself going back and forth to Orlando a couple of times a month. Um, I was generating um, uh, income through my website and sponsorships and products and, and other things that I had done. And um, I realized that if I wanted to sort of do this full time, if I wanted to really sort of live the dream that I needed to take that leap of faith. And I say this for illustrative purposes only that um, I had a very supportive wife and family behind me. I brought money to my closing in New Jersey because I, I was so all in in this idea of, of pursuing the dream. And I moved to, uh, to Florida in 2008. Do you think it was risky in the sense that you were you concerned about being profitable or was money not the primary concern at that point? Money wasn't the primary concern. Money was starting to come in, and I saw uh, what was happening in terms of monetization options, in terms of sponsorships and events and product sales and things that I could do to monetize it. Uh, I started to realize early on that there was a huge potential, but in order for me to reach it, I did need to take that leap of faith and be down. I needed to be where my business was, which is in the Orlando area. And so now then, do you generate most of your income just by virtue of sponsorships, tours, or speaking engagements? Yeah, so there's been a lot of secondary and tertiary businesses that have uh, resulted from this. My primary source of income does come from sponsorships of the podcast and videos and events and things that I do. But you know, I also create other products. I do private tours. And now as a sort of third wheel, um, I've done a lot of speaking, not just about Disney, but more about sort of the journey about following your dream and pursuing your passion and doing what you love full time. And you mentioned that you went to Disney every year, but I wanted to ask you, do you did you have a strong connection to Walt Disney World from the very beginning at the age of three when you first visited the resort? Or do you think that passion sort of developed every year, each year when you went back to Disney World? It was, a, it was something that grew. I think all of us have a, a connection to Disney one way or other, whether we watched Walt on Sunday nights, the movies, Disney World, whatever it was. I really thank or blame my family <laughs> because it was, I think that's what really made me love this place you know, so much. It's not about Cinderella Castle. It's not about Dumbo. Okay, maybe it's about the food, but it really was about the memories that I shared with my family going there, the good times that we had every year. I think that instilled my love for the place and eventually my interest in it. So we talked about your podcasting. Would you say that's the same as WDW Radio, which is what I mentioned in the intro? Or is it the same, similar, or different? Yeah, so w WDW Radio is the name, sort of the umbrella for everything I do. It is the name of the audio podcast, but it also encompasses videos and live broadcasts and events and everything else that I do. And do you use your legal background and training in any of your day-to-day -day responsibilities? 
Absolutely. Uh, you know, people said, God, you, you spent all this time and money and, and effort and energy to, <laughs> to go to law school and pass the bar and clerk and do all these other things. But it, it definitely helps me in my day to day life because my business is a business and I am pretty, pretty much for the most part a solopreneur. So I need to use my legal background in terms of contracts, in terms of running the day to day operations of the business itself. Um, in a lot of ways, I probably never would have expected as I was going to law school had they come into play pretty much every day. Well, and bef we only have a few minutes remaining, but I have to ask you about the Dream Project. Can you tell us a little bit about it? So um, one of the things that's really most important to me from all this is something that I call the Dream Team Project. Uh, as I was writing my first book in 2003, uh, my father had developed cancer, and I went with him every day into Memorial Sloan Ketter Kettering in New York uh, for about 10, 12 weeks, and while I was there, uh, would walk by the pediatric ward and my heart really went out to those kids who were there. And I knew very early on I wanted to do something to help those kids, uh, not in terms of raising money for research that they would never benefit from, but to give them a little bit of that quote unquote Disney magic that, that I think a lot of us take for granted that we enjoy. So I committed to take proceeds from the sales of all of my books and donate it to a, a charity that would help some of those kids and their families get out of the hospital environment and get down to Walt Disney World. And since that time, the Dream Team project has grown in terms of other people wanting to be a part of it, volunteers, donors, uh, events. We have a, a marathon team for the Walt Disney World Marathon events, uh, auctions, and so much more. And over the past number of years, we've raised more than uh, a quarter of a million dollars for the Make-A-Wish Foundation of America. Wow. We work very closely with. So it's something that is uh, very personal to me and very dear to my heart. Well, I think it's a great initiative, Lou. And um, before we go, though, I want to ask you to give us a little bit of trivia. Can you tell us something about Walt Disney World that isn't very well known, but very fascinating? Gosh, very fascinating. You know, it's <laughs> <laughs> I'm like going through my trivia books in my mind because there there is so much um, from the minutia. I think one of the things that people don't realize about Walt Disney World, and one of the things that really intrigued me early on was the size, and especially if you've been out to Disneyland, it, it's very much locked into the four corners of Anaheim. It's very small, it's very quaint. Disney World is gigantic, as in like twice the size of Manhattan, like the size of San Francisco uh, in terms of, of size and scope. And they say, well, you know, we know there's Magic Kingdom and there's the four parks, they must have built everything up already. They only have used about a quarter of the space that they have available in these 47 square miles that they bought in secret back in the early 60s. Uh, so there's a lot of room for expansion, a lot of room for growth uh, for a place that really, you know, when you went in 1971, you could see it all in three, four days. Now, seven to 10 days probably isn't enough to do everything. Wow. And then before we go, though, I, I just want to say, here's a little bit of trivia about you that folks may not know, is that not only does your daughter have the same initials <laughs> as Mickey Mouse, MM, but she also shares the same birthday. <laughs> and she's on the cover of my second book. So. <laughs> oh, that's great. Well, I want to say thanks so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it, Lou. Thank you very much for having me, Spencer. For more information on this or other topics, subscribe to BloombergLaw.com. You can follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Thank you for joining us. Bye, everybody.